Hi guys and welcome to Shaping the Irish Flute, the third episode today. We're very lucky to be with Martin Meehan, a great flute player from County Arma in Northern Ireland. Uh, he answered a few questions last night for us about his Irish flute playing and his latest album, The Fox Lyman. Uh, if you liked the first two episodes, remember to sign up for the podcast on Facebook, Irish Flute Lessons, on our YouTube channel, Irish Flute Lessons, and you can also sign up for the newsletter on irishflutelessons.com. So stay tuned for the episode, and we'll see you again next Monday for a brand new Shaping the Irish Flute episode. Have a great week. Thank you very much. All right, so we are with Martin Meehan uh, tonight. We're very happy to have him on the show. Hey, Martin, how are you? Hey, Michelle, how's things? Thanks for, thanks for having me. It's, it's really a pleasure to, to get to meet and know you uh, tonight. Um, so my first question is actually the first and easy question. Can you tell us more about yourself and your history in the flute? Uh, well, I started playing the flute really when I was uh, 11 years old. Um, I started the tin whistle before that, so it was about six when I started the tin whistle, and then uh, moved on to the flute. So um, yeah, I started, we started learning music myself and my brother. We're living in Manchester at the time, so we started learning our music there. And um, there was quite there was a big big uh, pool of musicians really. Only starting out at that point, um, and we went to the Coltis branches and that type of thing, and we were getting taught there. Um, so it was the tin whistle and the boron were my, my instruments when I was young. Um, and Angela Usher was my tin whistle teacher. And uh, Mike McGoldrick was also my teacher. Um, but there's Peter Carberry was a big influence at that point. He was living in Manchester at that point as well. So he was he taught um, myself, my brother and the Farrells and the Diamonds. There was a whole a range of musicians, really young musicians at that time. Um, so we played in Keighley bands and different things because we were heavily involved in the coldest. And then in 1988, then we moved to Armagh in uh, the north of Ireland here. And uh, mm -hmm. really at that point then I started, I really started to learn the flute when we were kind of moving at that stage because I was, I was about 10, 10 years of age. So I really took, you know, I didn't really have a flute at that point either. I was playing a bit of a plastic flute. So then I got my first real flute when I was 11 and uh, Peg Needham, um, who was... Uh, who's no, sadly no longer with us, a lost common flute player, lived in Dundalk, and she took me under her wing when I was about 13, really, with Peg, and started. that's where I started making kind of strides at the flute, because at that point, I suppose when you're 11 years of age, you just transfer transferring your tin whistle skills onto the flute, so you just play the tin whistle on the flute, but when you start actually becoming moulded as a flute player, I was around 13 years of age, you know. Um, but it all came together really at that point when Peg started teaching me and I got a Sam Murray flute and everything started coming together. So, uh, yeah, so in around there's a bit of a journey really. So we started at six in the Tim Whistle and then the flute was around 11 and then started making progress with it really. It was about 13. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned Manchester because you're from Manchester, obviously, and there's a whole like community for Irish music back in Manchester. Uh, you mentioned Michael McGoldrick, which is like who's obviously like a very famous flute player from Manchester, but um, who else would you say has influenced your flute playing along your journey? Uh, well, the, the the three teachers really. Angela Usher was a huge influence um, on the tin whistle, and still is. Like you know, I was over in Manchester last year with my family, and um, spent spent the evening with with Micah and Angela and playing tunes and Debbie Garvey and people like that. You know, there was a great uh, community and it's great friendships that we still you know we still have that that strong bond now but Angela was a great and um, she had all the the foundations there the fundamentals of all the rules and all the phrasing and broke tunes down and was very very patient so at a young age I had that foundation to build on you know and then uh, with, with Mike then as well he, you know he was um, a great influence as well uh, very encouraging, you know, we used to would have played in the Boron competitions in Fla, Mike would have played the flute for me or the tin whistle for me and that type of thing. And he guided me in the muscle as well. And it was really Mike who steered me to go towards the flute. Um because he was really the only flute player uh, in Manchester at that point. Um as such really there was other flute players as well but Mike was the one who kind of stood out. And he's not that much older than me either he really so it was kind of looked up to him, you know. Yeah. So um yeah as I say in the end Peter Carberry was um really laid down a strong foundation for us all in Manchester at that point and, and, and had high expectations and 
high standards and we had to beat them really you know what i mean it was all done mm-hmm. in a very encouraging manner you know and um, but in terms of flute playing then itself peg obviously you know peg needham as as my teacher um it's a huge amount of admiration for her as a flute player and person she was just a beautiful person a fantastic flute player and she really did guide me you know in terms of tone and phrasing and everything like that she really got all the fundamentals so really what angela had really instilled and mike had encouraged peg was able to transfer that that over to the flute and i kind of suppose i never consciously thought of it when i was young but when you ha- when you're used to being taught in that manner it just the formula really kind of transfers over to another an, an instrument, you know. And it, mm-hmm. was, you know yourself when you're playing a tin whistle, when you transfer to a flute, you do have to take a step back and understand that the phrasing is different, that the breath control and the tone and all that has to come together. So Peg was very good in that, and she was instrumental in my development. But um, in terms of flute players, I used to listen to it would be Conlon Grado with a, a top of Coom album. I listened to that religiously, you know. Obviously the Matt Malloy albums. Mm-hmm. Um, we nearly had a visitor there. Somebody just popped their head in the ceiling. <laughs> yeah, I just you know, um, but when I got a bit older, then um, oh, also the very close friend uh, who recently passed away, Aidan Prunty, when I was living in Armagh, um, myself and Aidan, uh, up until his sudden death only a few months ago, were, were very very close friends, and he was a great influence to me, you know. And the, the on the Fox's Lament album. The little mm-hmm. pig, the second, I think it's the second track on the album. I learned those tunes from Aiden. And okay. we used to together all the time. Um, and then myself and Aiden used to, when I got older then, I was about 16 or so, myself and Aiden used to go to Belfast um, to, get the tra- to get the bus up to Belfast from Armagh. And I'd play along with Sam Murray, um, Brenton O'Hare, Harry Bradley, Michael Clarkson. We used to have flute sessions, you know. Yeah. And, and Leslie Bingham as well. Um, and it was just great, you know, because it, the, the the kind of the northern style and of that strong powerful tone and everything that was that was kind of really really kind of uh instilled into your playing you know so uh yeah but it, it, it is a journey you, you know i think when you're young and that and even even now as, as an adult you know you continue to listen to different flute players and listen to old flute players and up and going flute players and learn new tunes and picking up new things you know yeah. so uh, a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a mixed bag but it's a, it's been a bit of, it's the journey it's the journey that we're all on i suppose you know through that, yeah, and uh, and you mentioned Harry Bradley and, and such. I mean, it's true now you're on you're in Northern Ireland, and you kind of answered my my next question, which was, now that you're in Northern Ireland, would you say that your style has been influenced by the very pulsy, breathy, punchy style of Northern Ireland compared to what you maybe used to do before? Yeah, well, that definitely in terms of the uh, your tone and uh, you, you know, you suppose the manner in which you kind of. You would go for a tune, you know, and I, you know, I admit I do play fast as a flute player, and I enjoy playing fast. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say I don't, because I do. If I did, you know, it's a great release. And uh, yeah. playing with Harry and Sam, it was great having Sam in Belfast at the time when he was making the flutes. Uh, you know, because I was playing Sam's flutes, and um, so he used to go up and visit Sam in the workshop, and then he'd always go around to maybe Kelly Sellers or Madden's Bar or something like that, and. Uh, mm-hmm. Michael Clarkson was there, say Harry, Brendan O'Hare, and we'd all meet up and play over the tunes. And it, it was great. There was no there was no messing, there was no fancy tunes. It was just proper old style flute tunes. Yeah. Good, good steady playing, you know, everything about it just was right. And when you're playing with, with musicians like that and flute players of that caliber, there's nowhere to hide really in a sense. And not even no, no, nowhere to hide, but it does it, it kind of um it molds you, you're you playing with these players and your tone has to get up there and you have to play in tune and it really helps with your phrasing because you're you're playing alongside them all the time, you know? Um, so in definitely in terms of my tone and that, I, it, I would put it down to, first of all, Peg, Peg Needham, um, obviously who taught me one, one-on-one and then going to that. Being with Aidan Prunty and going up to Belfast and playing with these, with the, with the Belfast flute players there. Mm-hmm. And, and, I still get up and still get to I see them regular and get playing with them when, when they're knocking about. But um, yeah, but then uh, saying that, then like I, you know, as I said, I, I do, I know I do, I'm aware that I play fast and I enjoy playing fast with other musicians, which goes against the way the likes of Harry and, and Michael and that would play as well. They do a little more rhythmic, but more punchy. Um, but I say, look, at, at the end of the day, you, you take all these things on and you, and you, you kind of develop it in, into your own expression yeah. you know people talk about styles but it's more of a it's more the way you express your own playing as well and enjoy playing you know what i mean yeah yeah 
Um, so fast forward 2020, what's your situation today? Do you teach flute? Do you have like other projects going on, musically speaking? Yeah, well, I've just relocated um, to Port Stewart, which is the north coast of Ireland, um, mm -hmm. Port Rush. So I live in Port Stewart um, at the minute. I think just some pinged on the computer there. <laughs> it came up, you know. Yeah. Uh, so my wife has just started a music school here at the minute, and I have a flute class at the uh, and we've about I think it's about twelve flutes and tin whistles, and we've only the past six months that even with the coronavirus and the, and the lockdown, yeah, and classes and that going and uh, the Skype lessons and that type of thing. So relocating here now, of kind of. You know, I have flute players at home in Armagh who I taught, but now up in Port Stewart, we have a whole kind of um, new generation of flute players coming through, I suppose, in a sense. And uh, so I enjoy teaching there, I enjoy teaching the, the, my new students. Um, and then I've been doing, um, always been playing alongside my brother, um, Paul, on the guitar. Mm -hmm. um, and I play, I've done the last, actually, just before the lockdown, myself and Donald O'Connor had done a couple of gigs, which would, we play alongside each other quite a lot. Don't be very close friend. So, look, I just keep going. You know, nobody can really see what we like music's going at the minute. Um, so, but I do enjoy, like, like I love getting out playing the sessions, to be honest. I do, I like doing the cycles and performances and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I do love sessions. Like, that's where I feel most comfortable, to be honest, just sitting, playing tunes and enjoying myself that way. And my sister doesn't live too far from Port Stewart now as well. She lives in Derry. She's only about 45 minutes away. So, I can mm -hmm. see and seeing my sister as a fiddle player, getting to see her now more often and get playing the tunes with her as well. So that's what that's what our plans are, just to keep keep the music strong in the area and, and uh, just keep going out and playing the sessions and see what see how things develop. As I say, with the COVID nineteen, nobody knows what we like music's going yeah. So uh, just try and get out and enjoy it and support it as best we can as well. No, uh, yeah, I hear you. We're actually just having a session in my living room this afternoon here because lockdown is like kinda over. Yeah. So it was our first like home session, you know, kitchen type session with friends around the table, and it sure feels really nice to have the music on, you know. And yeah, yeah, yeah good stuff. We, have, we haven't had that luxury yet, which is kind of the children playing stuff like that. So we're playing in the house a wee bit, but yeah, kind of miss going out and playing in the in the pub, playing a few tunes. I'm sure. I'm it'll sure. Come it'll come around. Yeah. Um, so you were saying you're teaching the flute. What would be your number one advice for someone looking to start the flute? Um, well, I suppose tones, everything. You know what I mean. Um, obviously, the fingering's one thing, but uh, tone and the breath control is huge. You know, even um, the students I have now at the minute is to taking a breath and using the upper part of the lungs as opposed to using the diaphragm and yeah, really instilling that. The, the, the necessity to have a good strong tone and as I as I say to my flute students you know um, if you have a fiddle player who's not using the bow or using the bow incorrectly you're not gonna no matter how good the left hand is you're not going to get any sound out of the fiddle you're going to get the right tone out of the fiddle so no matter how good you your your, your fingering is and your rules and everything like that if you haven't got the if you haven't got a strong tone if you haven't got a proper tone and your phrasing's not right yeah. it it's all a lot so, so for me my uh my my big thing would be with us certainly when I'm teaching is is to get a good good solid tone and, and get the breath control, and uh, and that means then you can you can enjoy it you can enjoy the tunes a bit more. Yeah. Okay. Um, back to your music playing, you've played and recorded with like many many musicians. Can, can you remember one specific encounter, or do you have one specific memory of of like a concert that will stay out stand out? You know of, of the others. Yeah, I suppose um, it was about 10 years ago, we played alongside Lima Winley from the Hothouse Flowers and uh, Shimi O'Dowd. And again, Donald O'Connor mentioned earlier, we, we'd done a game. We played in a few places, but the one that stood out to me really is we played in the studio theatre in Armagh. And uh, family and friends were there, really, but that was the first time, that was our first concert together. And um, Lima Winley would have been a huge influence. You know, as a as a young teenager, used to listen to Hollywood stars all the time, and they had the opportunity to play alongside him, and him and Shami and Donald and kind of hang out together. It was a whole build up to it, really. It was just kind of hanging out, and we were doing a few things, and then the rehearsals were great, just really, really creative, and the respect. 
amongst everybody and everything about that was just fantastic. And that was definitely the most enjoyable concert I've ever played at, you know. Okay. Um, easy question. What's your practice routine? What do you do like, on a daily basis to keep the food going, you know? Yeah, uh, just I have it sitting out usually and just pick it up and play a few tunes. It might be, I don't really have a, a routine as such, you know. It could be just um, a tune I might hear in the, on the radio or I might hear in a CD and or I could hear my wife playing and one of my kids playing and just try it out in, a, in, a, in another room, you know. And so I don't really have... You know, not, not when I was younger, I would have had more of a routine. You know what I mean? I would have gone over the scales and mm -hmm. even uh, rules, just going up and down the scales with the rules and that type of thing. And um, remember, Paul McGlinchey, a great flute player, gave me uh, gave me advice a long time ago when I was I must have been about fourteen. Mm -hmm. I haven't done it now for a long time, but remember, <laughs> for years <laughs> when I was young, he used to say, "Stand in the corner of a room." So obviously, with the two walls meet. If you stand and play there, the music comes straight, the, the, the sound, the flute, the tone comes straight back at the end. So if it's airy at all, you can hear then if it's anything, anything's escaping, you know. So I remember I used to do that quite a lot, stand in the corner of the room playing the flute. But uh, I haven't done that now for quite a while. But that's, that's, a, good, that's a good one. That's a good I one. should try that tomorrow. <laughs> My wife's going to look at me like weird, but I'll explain it. Yeah. <laughs> it might look like you're being punished and you get stand in the corner. But, <laughs> but it yeah. works. Work in the works. I'm sure it does. No, that's uh, I'll try that for sure. <laughs> um, what would be your go-to tunes for like starting a set or the tunes that you love playing anytime? Um, I suppose jigs. You know, I like jigs, and um, I'm not great with names them to be honest. But um, I play a lot with my wife as a fiddle player. You know, mm -hmm. and I suppose it's association. If we're, go we're going out and playing locally, there's always a few tunes, a few. Oh, Jigs, I can't actually say. I'm not too sure of the names of them, but they they would they would jump out those most of the time. But it's again, it depends who you're playing with. You know, you know, if, if you're playing with a musician you haven't seen in a while, I always find there's always an association to a tune or a set of tunes that you might do, or it's a link, or somebody might trigger out. You know, by even just associating whatever instrument they have, it might there might be an association to a specific tune, and mm -hmm. um, that's why that's why I would kind of uh, go with it. You know, but um. As I say, when you play locally, when you're playing with the same musicians, and um, there's always a wee bank of tunes that there's every, well, no, no matter what area you're in, there's always little bank of tunes that people kind of rely on and end up falling back on, you know? Okay. Um, back to your music. So you recorded two albums, the last one being The Fox Clements, is it? Yeah. That's it. And uh, I, I must say, I really like the covers, and I, I, I couldn't help but see that both were painting style covers and I was just curious as to if it was someone's like artwork that you like and you wanted to feature on the cover like how did you come up with that style of cover and, and what was the process behind it well the the first album the uh, Three's Company album was um, Barry Carr who'd, who'd done the painting for that you know oh nice and uh, Barry's from Armage you know and he's a very old friend of mine so uh, was, he asked me to play it he was he had done uh, an exhibition an art exhibition and myself, my brother, and I can't remember who else it was. I can't remember who the other music. There's maybe three or four of us were playing at the exhibition. It could have been Sora, in fact. And then um, we were playing anyway, and um, all the paintings were around, obviously. And I remember just seeing that one at the time, and it just caught my eye. And then it was about a year later, then um, I just started recording the album. So the phone Barry and I just said, Would you mind? But he had sold it, but what, he, he went and got a picture of it. He had a print of it, some description. So he, yeah, so he was he was very happy for me to use it, you know. And then, so that was that was the first album cover sword, and then the second album cover is uh, JB Valley, and Brian Valley then obviously uh, established the Armour Pipers Club. Mm -hmm. I've been taught the Armour Pipers Club for a long time, and um, good friends with all the Valleys. We would have grown up, grew up with uh, Keevin. We would have been knocking about together over uh, over the years, and um, so Brian that that Peyton he he said he based it on me, not. But, when I was about, I think I must have been around 18, 19 at the time. Mm. Um, and I remember going in, there was the Piping Festival in Armagh and we had the exhibition on, that was a big, huge painting. And um, he, he said to me that he he based that, the painting on, on the way I hold the flute. So then for the second album, then um, Brian got me the print. And he again, uh, he was he was happy for me to use it. And I was delighted that the Barry and Brian, uh, you know, allowed me to because 
Yeah, it was art. I suppose art. You know, it, it, I, I felt that the, 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 the covers were great. I really liked them. And, you know what I mean? And, yeah. Stuff like that, so... That's yeah, they really they really stand out, and that's why I wanted to ask the question about them. And actually, you mentioned Barry Kerr. He will be on the show in a few weeks, too. So just yeah. for you know, the viewers out there. Um, but anyways, so back to the album, the Fox Lament, which is on the album, a very nice slow air. Um, why did you choose that like track, that tune for the title of the album? Does it have a special meaning for like for you? I I, I kind of like the 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 well the. The air itself is lovely. I learned it from a uh, great piper, uh, Dickie Deegan, fantastic piper and a great man. And um, mm -hmm. who he he recorded it, and then um, Dickie was when I was living in Arma, we used to live out in the country, uh, very it was very very rural. And um, Dickie and Milo Thelwall, a very good friend of ours, came to visit for the weekend, and um, we were playing a few tunes. And Dickie had played that in the house as well. I asked him to play it. He played it, and then. So I suppose at the time when 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 the when I recorded the Fox's Lament, it was I was living in Armagh and I was living in that rural setting and everything about I suppose the where the environment we were living in and then the name of the tune, the Fox's Lament, it kind of all tied in together and then fond memories as well of obviously Dicky coming and visiting us. So um yeah, so we just decided to go with that. Okay. Uh What's next for you after like the two albums recorded? Do you have any plan for another album coming out soon, or are you touring whenever this COVID like situation you know gets better? Uh, no, no plans as yet for the recordings. You know, uh, it takes me an awful long time to 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 get, actually get around to do it. Like the first the first recording was something I, wa I wanted to do. Um, is really just a, something to look back on at that time in your life, and then everything moves on so quickly and then see, it was 10 years and um sarah was you know my wife sarah and Donald o'connor who's who recorded they were seeing you know to get start getting getting the sets together and start getting back in and just for that reason really i suppose as well it's just getting something documented at that time and you know the kind of little snapshot of where you are in your life and so i've no plans yet as to do any recordings but um We'll see we'll, we'll keep things you know we always, it's always good to keep an open mind and see how things develop and see where we're going for in the future but as i say it's very there's only certain times ahead and we don't know what way it's gonna what way things are gonna go like um so in terms of live performances and that type of thing so we'll have to just see keep 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 an open mind and uh as i say i have no plans to do a recording as, as yet but who knows another another year or so things might change yeah. Let's just hope it won't be another 10 years because <laughs> I think a lot of fruit players are looking forward to the next one anyways. Um, the We're getting like to the end of the interview part. Uh, quick one for the fruit players. This is like a recurring questions on like many podcasts. What what kind of flutes do you play on? Uh, I play the uh, Gert Lejeune now. Uh, it's my main flute. Mm -hmm. flute. And I really, really love it. I ha I've had it a year. Um, I had a keyless gear the June before that mm -hmm. for here as well but my current flute now I'm really really happy with it and so I played Gertz mainly and then um I was Sam Murray E flat um uh, uh Gilles Hart B flat mm -hmm. and a C flute that's a kind of it's um there's a headpiece of um um Stefan Gabriel mm -hmm. finger finger holes of um Mike Grinter yeah and a tail piece of Sam Murray so wow <laughs> bit, of a, bit of a mix mix up but it works it works you know so uh i was just had bits in the house and i was trying it and it, it works outside so that's that's kind of a body mixture flute yeah it's a, the franken flute yeah <laughs> exactly yeah but it works yeah i'm sure uh, gail's flute are sure getting like popular in northern Ireland. i feel because gail's leaving like an hour from my house and i used to have a, a lejeune flute and he's a good friend yeah. And uh, he's traveling a lot to Northern Ireland, all the festivals and such, because he's getting so many requests today. I feel. Yeah, his flutes. I'm very, very fond of them. They're the great. Like my two of my sons have his two of his flutes. I play one. I've got have one for a couple for my students here. Um, but the, when I was younger, I was just saying about you know and being in Belfast and playing and playing Sam Murray flutes and that. And I was playing Mike Grinder flutes for a while, but it didn't for me as great as the fruit was it did really i feel it didn't really suit my style of playing either you know and i was used to 
salmon's fruits where they were, you could blow them hard and you got good mm-hmm. strong. And I feel that the legume fruit produces that. And, uh, you know, the, obviously, the, as, as more and more of the fruit is maturing, it's really kind of getting that earthy, solid sound. And uh, it's great, solid tone. And I'm very happy with it. It's great. Nice. Nice. Okay. Do you have any uh, Facebook page, website, uh, like uh, webs that you want to share, you know, where we can buy the album or find more information about you? Yeah. Um, well, the Facebook is Martin Mehan Music. And the website then is Moro Kane set, the, set a website up. He's got a trad center. So if you go trad center, I think it's tradcenter.com forward slash Martin. And that'll have uh, that'll be a link then to to the website. Right. Facebook. We'll, we'll put this down on the screen. The magic of editing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, perfect. All right. Well, th- thank you very much, Martin. The last part is the snap questions. You know, so I say like green or blue, or you the blue, but it's really like you know Irish music oriented. Right. Okay. Right. All right. The first one: Guinness or Smithix? Guinness. Jig or real? Uh, Jig. Okay. F or B flat? B flat. Flute or whistle? Flute. Okay. Uh, Pratton or Rudel? What is it? Pratton or Rudel? Yeah. Uh, Rudel. Okay. Piper or Rockstra grip? Uh, Rockstar. Okay. Cran or roll? Roll. And slow or fast? Oh, fast all day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you very much, Martin, for being on the show. Uh, so it's going to be live tomorrow, Monday, 22nd of June on the Facebook page. Uh, do you have anything you want to share with the viewers before wrapping up? No, just thank thank you for inviting me along for the interview today and look forward to, to be here in the, in the flesh at some point. <laughs> Hopefully. I'm sure we will. All right. Thank you very much, Martin. Have a great night. You too. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks for joining again today. We were, again, very happy to create that podcast with Martin this week. Um, If you like this third episode and you want to support us, you can always sign up to the newsletter on irishfruitlessons.com. You can uh, follow us on Facebook, Irish Fruit Lessons, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Irish Fruit Lessons. We're also available as an audio podcast if you want to listen to that a podcast on the go. We're on most major platforms, Spotify, Google Podcast, and iTunes. Um, feel free to drop us a message anywhere on the YouTube, the Facebook, if you want to you know, comment and uh, react to those videos. And we're hoping to see you again next week. Have a great week. Thank you.